Shalom, everyone. Happy Wednesday to you all. It's the Native night for me on TV. Well, on YouTube or wherever I'm at. I don't know exactly. I'm in somewhere in space. But anyway, I want to thank you for joining me. Now, hopefully, last time I gave you plenty to think about. And I didn't get very far. And for some of you, I sent this week's ideas of things that I'm going to talk about. But even if I read the 11 pages that I sent you, I still wouldn't have an hour to get through all of it. So we'll probably go as far as we can. Then we'll come back next week for part three. Then I'm hopefully by then I'll be able to go back to the beginning of Daniel chapter 11 and give you an understanding of the chronology of the history going all the way up to then. Right now, I want to spend my time giving you the chronology that the Jewish rabbis have not come to conclusion on. And that's the last five verses of Daniel chapter 11, starting at verse 40. So that's my goal is to try to get to that point of, of giving you that information. But when I do, I, I want you to understand there's a lot of history that you have to know in order to make sense of the of the Bible passage itself. And since that time has already passed, it's much easier to make sense of it. If you if you read the, the chronicles of, of the rabbis, you'll find that most of them rely on Rashi and Rambam and Vilna Gaon and all of the rest of them who are 200, 300, 400 years away from now. And so there's not a lot of speculation now regarding those five verses. In fact, they're kind of ignored, to be very honest, because it, it talks about something that they, if you're going by the rest of the chapter, you really struggle with. So I want to I want to start there. I also want you to remember that this whole thing really, this chapter has really been triggered by October 7th, 2023. And I say that because I believe that's the date that ended Daniel's 70 weeks. I also think that Hamas must have been reading God's mind because they jumped the gun. You see, Hamas was not supposed to attack. The attack wasn't supposed to come for another three days. And it was to include Hezbollah in the north. And it was to include Syria. And some are conjecturing that there may have been a situation where the Palestinians, who now live in Jordan, who outnumber the true Jordanians, actually would join into the fight. Plus, as you know, what's going on in the West Bank and you know what's going on in other parts of the country, there's already uprisings among the Palestinians there. In fact, there's been bombings and all kinds of events have gone on. So God has orchestrated October 7th in a strategic way because I believe he's established that as the end of what I call the time of the Gentiles. From now on, this is about God ministering to his people and at the same point in time, I want you to look with me back to the book of Daniel, but I want you to go to chapter 7. They're not in my notes. I, I'm winging it off the top of my head. But anyway, chapter 7, book of Daniel, and I want you to look at verse number 12. Now, you remember chapter 7 deals with four empires. In the Jewish understanding, the first empire was Persia, the second empire was uh, Babylon, then it was Persia, then it was uh, Greece, and then finally it was Rome. But I want you to look at verse number 12. You see, verse number 12 says, well, actually start in verse, yeah, verse 12. As for the rest of the beasts, that's the beast that we've talked about, their dominion was taken away. Yet an extension of life was given to them until a season and a time. Now, the problem we have, everybody assumes that time automatically means 
a, a year or a season means just what it says. But that's not been so when we go through the book of Daniel, because we're finding that seasons and time itself may actually be seven year periods or seasons may be three and a half year periods. So we can't honestly say we know exactly, but we do know that the British empire, the Persian empire, and the Greek empire, and the Roman empire for that matter, have all really lost their sway, their, their power, some at various different times. But the idea is that those, those are not the empires of today. Those are not the ones we watch so much today. We're all interested in the United States because the United States, if I, if you remember, was the eagle's wings that had been plucked off of the lion. And by Heim Solomon's money, contributions, the Revolutionary War, the United States became its own independent state. Right now, the United States looks like it wants to be joining back up with Britain as we go back to what the kids are looking at as a socialist republic which never happens, but that's the direction they seem to be wanting us to go. So these, all these empires have come and gone. And so we're looking at new characters and new situations at this particular point in time. Now, when, what was the last Thursday, there was a conversation that was had on, on uh, Rod's broadcast in the morning in which I brought up the idea of the tribulation, Daniel's 70th week, as most people call it. The time of Jacob's trouble is another word that's used for it. And we, I made the comment that that week that we're talking about could very well have been seven years and could very well have been the Holocaust in which one third of all Jews across the world died. Now, they weren't all Adolf Hitler's fault. Joseph Stalin was doing the same thing in Russia because he had become anti-Semitic. He had reached the point where <clears throat> it doesn't matter. And so he was eliminating. In fact, he got started when Hitler and he had agreed to have a pact between the two of them. And Hitler says, I don't like to see Jews in your, in your parliament. And so Stalin simply removed them. Some of them he removed permanently. They no longer existed after they were asked to leave. So we're looking at a, at a time difference, but I want you to look at it even more differently. I want you to go to your book, your Bible, and go to Jeremiah chapter 30, verse number seven. And I want to talk about that tribulation period, if, there, if that's what we want to call it. But in Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7, now I'm going to read to you out of my art scroll, which is a little bit different than what you would have in many of the other versions. Uh, but this is how my Bible reads it. Woe, for that day is great, with none like it. And it's a time of distress for Jacob. Now, through which he shall be saved. Now, in the King James Version, it's pretty clear. It says, alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble. The New King James, the American Standard, the Berean, the English Bible, the World English Bible, the NIV, all say the same thing, time of Jacob's trouble. And so we're looking at probably what Daniel was talking about from a different point of view. So... As we go through this, I want to go back and remind us, go to Daniel chapter 9, and I want you to go to, to uh, 24. Again, beginning with the end in mind, this is where the world will be at the end. This is not where the world is at this point in time, but I think what we're seeing happening is actually close to leading us to this place. <clears throat> excuse me, in, in 924, he begins, in my Bible, it's called seven septets, or seven weeks of seven, have been decreed upon all, upon your people and upon your holy city 
to terminate transgressions to an end, to end sin, to wipe away iniquity and to bring everlasting righteousness, to confirm the visions and the prophets and the anoint and to anoint the holy of holies. That's what's coming. Not any of that really has happened so far. We're just talking about where we're going. Daniel Daniel only wanted to know, when do we get to go home? What's the 70, when does the 70 years end? And Gabriel began to talk to him about 70 weeks. So Daniel was, I would say, confused, just like I've been confused for years, trying to figure out Wait a second, that wasn't what I asked. I was talking to a friend today about a simple question I thought it took us an hour and 15 minutes. And you know, when I hung up, I wasn't any better off than I was before. I still hadn't figured out what, what it was that I was asking him was what he answered. But anyway, I got lots of information, things that I'm going to share with you, not tonight, but later on. Now, Jacob's time did not bring any of those ideas that we read in that verse. But I can tell you the week that that could have occurred, the week when the world, when tribulation was Jacob's trouble, happened during the 69th week on Daniel's calendar. But Daniel's calendar that talks about weeks doesn't mean weeks as we understand it. I believe weeks means years of jubilee. In other words, 49-year cycles. Interesting thing. I was reading the book of Jubilee. I don't know if you have the book of Jubilee or if you've even looked at the book of Jubilee. But the book of Jubilee deals with uh, the idea of time, how time works. And one of the things that struck me came in the sixth chapter. It's in the verses 17 and 18 of chapter six in the book of Jubilee. Should not again be a flood on the earth to destroy it all the days of the earth. For this reason, it is ordained and written on the heavenly tablets that they should celebrate the feast of weeks this week, month, once a year, to renew the covenant every year. And this whole festival was celebrated in heaven from the day of creation until the days of Noah. 26 jubilees and five weeks of years. Did you hear that? So the celebration of Noah began on the 26th jubilee, in the 26th jubilee cycle, not on the day of the 26th, but five weeks into that. Now, as we're going through this, they get so specific that they tell us that it happened in the year 1309 or on the Jewish calendar, <laughs> excuse me, 1659. And Noah and his sons observed it for seven jubilees and one, week, one of the weeks till the day of Noah's death. So from the time of the flood, we had 25 jubilees. After the flood, we had another six jubilees. Do you want to guess when Israel came out of bondage in Egypt? I want you to turn to Genesis, and we're going to go to the sixth chapter. Because he coded it in. In Genesis chapter 6, I want you to notice what frustrated God so much, that in verse number 3, Genesis 6, verse number 3, And Hashem said, My spirit shall not contend any more concerning man, since he is but flesh. His days shall be a hundred and twenty years. The day Israel left Egypt was the beginning of the 50th cycle. From that day until October 7th, we have now gone through 100 
and 20 Jubilee cycles. You see, the word man in there throws us off. The word man there is actually Adam. So from the creation of Adam to that point. Now that also is going to give us something, and I'm I'm prequilling this to you so that you have time to think about it. If you read the New Testament, you hear Jesus is called Son of Man. Where did that term first get used? Actually, it was used in the book of Ezekiel. And in Ezekiel, God calls Ezekiel Son of Man. He calls him the Son of Man. Now, to give you another tidbit, go back to Ezekiel chapter 1. Aren't you glad you got a lot of pages in your Bible to go flipping through? We're going to go to the first and second verse of, of Ezekiel, so we're not going to go far. But I want to talk to you about time, since that seems to be my message for tonight is time. Remember, time is like a river. It flows. And depending on where you are on the bank as the water passes you, it's like history. You watch history. You can look back at history. What you see is in front of you, you don't always see because the river bends or whatever have you. So you don't see very far. Well, Ezekiel tried to help me understand where he was standing on the bank of the water. And the water was called the River Kavar. Now, the Hebrew word for Kavar is the word already. So we're already at this place. What place are we at? Well, it happened in the 30th year, in the fourth month of the fifth of the month, as I was among the exiles by the already river. Now the heavens opened, and I saw visions of God. Now on the fifth of the month, which is the fifth year of the exile of Jehoiakim. If you know when Jehoiakim was taken off the throne and Ezekiel found himself where he's at, you will understand where in time Ezekiel was because he's giving you a roadmap as to when he was there. Now, I'm going to leave that question in your head because what I want you to understand is he is talking to us in jubilees. He's in the middle of a jubilee at this point in time. He's giving us an understanding. When he says the, the fifth year after Jehoiakim, that was the year that Jehoiakim decided he was no longer going to pay tribute to the Babylonians. Instead, he was going to build an, an agreement with the Egyptians. And in building that agreement with the Egyptians, he decided he would send his tax money to them and not to, well, you know how Nebuchadnezzar would react to the fact that the money wasn't coming anymore. He sent out his tax collectors. When he sent out his tax collectors, his army, they collected everything they needed, including Jehoiakim. He was eliminated. And at that point in time, we happened to be in the 25th or the 30th year of the cycle of 25, the 25th cycle since Ezekiel or since, Ezekiel, or since uh, Moses led Egypt. Israel out of Egypt. A time stamp. The Bible is full of time stamps. The only problem is they use words that that kind of mean that, but they don't exactly mean that. And so Jubilee cycles are often seen as years, when in actuality, they're 49-year periods. And from the beginning of time, until October 7th, we had gone through 70 cycles. 70. And now we are moving into the world that's beyond, beyond what Daniel was told about. Now we have to go looking at other stories. 
if we want to understand Gog and Magog. We have to go to Ezekiel 38 and 39. We have to go to Zechariah 12, 13, and 14. We have to go to other places. Ezekiel talks about the temple. We have to go all the way back to Ezekiel chapter 40 through 48. We are going to have to read the Bible differently in order to pick up what's coming. But know that it's all about Israel. The rest of us are stories that are in the past. God kept the nations alive because they're not important, and the significance now turns to God's own people. We are now at that point. When that battle began, remember, our president was gung-ho one, one step behind Netanyahu. But then all of a sudden, out of the woodwork, what happened? All kinds of people began to show that they were Palestinian by trade. Not really. But the streets were filled with them. In fact, there was one fight or one demonstration in New York City, which really caught my attention. You see, on one side, there were all of the Christians and there were the Jews that were raising their, Palest or raising their Israeli flags and, and supporting Israel. But on the other side of the street, there were Jews and Palestinians. Well, what were the Jews doing on the other side of the street? Well, you see, Chabad doesn't believe that Israel should exist until the Messiah comes. And so they're protesting, you're taking land away from the Palestinians. Stop thinking that. First off, there were no, there are no Palestinians. Palestine was created by the British after World War I. You see, the, that will be part of my story. Maybe I should jump ahead to give you an understanding. In World War I, in the middle of the war, the British and the French were at odds with, obviously, the Axis powers, which was Austria and Germany, and the Ottoman Empire. Well, the fight was really between French and the British trying to hold the line. At the same time, they had convinced the Tsar of Russia to join the fight. The only problem was the Tsar of Russia was run out of town. In fact, his whole family ended up in prison, and they all ended up dying in prison. And in their place rose a man named Vladimir Lenin. And you know what happened? They said, we don't want to take part in this war. And so they walked away. Now, at the same point in time, the French and the British had already convinced the United States to get involved. The only problem was the United States... They didn't have airplanes that they could fly everybody over there. In fact, they figured it would take them six months to a year in order to get the troops from the United States there. And so what's going on? Well, they're now fighting the, the Germans and the Austrians, but they're also fighting the Ottomans, which are the Turkish people. And actually, Turkey controlled all of the Middle East. Only then it was called the Far East. And you see, there was no country there. It was all part of the Ottoman Empire. No country. There was no Iraq. There was no Syria. There was no Lebanon. There was no Israel. There was no Saudi Arabia. None of that. You see, that's what they were negotiating between the French and the, and the British. If we pull this off, let's divide up. We will call ourselves protectors. Let's divide up the, that area. Because you see, there's plenty of value there. Britain wanted the, the Israeli land. Why? It wasn't because of oil. It was a land bridge to go from Europe closely or easily over to the, the uh, sea and from there into India, where they did a lot of trading. So they were negotiating over the land, while at the same time, they talked the Arabs into going to war with the Turks. 
You, you ever watch the movie Lawrence of Arabia? Lawrence of Arabia is about the story of World War I when the British convinced the sheiks to join their side. Well, it, it's I find it fascinating because technically two two different groups came. One of them's group was the Transjordan, Heshemite Kingdom of Transjordan. They called themselves Hephas. And at that time, the Hephas themselves said, we're willing to fight if you make us an independent, independent nation. He says, well, how big do you want? He says, well, basically, we want everything in Saudi Arabia, lower Syria. We want Lebanon. We want Israel. They weren't nations back then. We want the Edomite kingdom. We want the Moabites. We want the, the uh, Ammonites. That's, that's what we want. Well, we'll give it to you if you fight for us. And so they began the process of fighting. Well, there was another king whose name was Saud. Saud also heard about the what was going to happen. He says, well, why don't you cut us in? In fact, we can cut out it's Transjordan. We'll cut them out because they're just Bedouins. They're not Arabs. They're Bedouins. And everybody knows that you're better off negotiating with a true Arab and not a Bedouin. And so Britain and France made another deal. So now they've given the land away to the Arabs and they've given the land away to the Heshemites or the Bedouins. And they've also made an agreement with Israel through Weissman, who had created for them what's called an acetone. The acetone was to cause the gunpowder to be smokeless. And he was a chemist, a good one. In fact, he helped organize and start the Hebrew University in Jerusalem with the help of Albert Einstein. Now, they agreed that they're going to do this and they will get the land that would eventually be called Palestine because there was no name Palestine attached to this land at that point in time. The name Palestine came from the Brits. The Brits gave got the land and got that name from the Romans. And the Romans didn't want Israel to be a nation, so they gave the land to the Philistines. So the original land name was Philistia. And it converted over and over again into where it's at. Now, that's what's going on in history. We know that after the war was done, the Brits got their part. The French got their part. They wanted the northern section. The Brits wanted the south. And they wanted Egypt. In fact, they went to war for Egypt. And Egypt became a part of their their territory at that point in time. And so this land was now locked between the two. And oh yeah, the Saudis were given Saudi Arabia. They were given the land that was given to them. And we'll get to the text. In fact, why don't I skip to the text? Go to Daniel chapter 11, and we're going to look at one of the last verses in chapter 11. Let's see. Uh, okay. Chapter 11, verse 31, 41, 41. He, that's the king of the north. And I'll tell you, the king of the north is Britain at this point in time. So I can give you a clue. He, Britain, shall enter also into the beauteous land, Israel. And many countries shall be overthrown. But these shall be delivered out of his hand. Edom, Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon. So the Bedouins, the Heshemite kingdom of Transjordan, receives those nations, those tribes. Again, Bedouins in the minds of the Saudis. 
What's left off of this list is the Saudis themselves. But the Saudis are going to get their, their section quite quickly. But after it's all said and done, Britain and France has carved up all the land. It's done in what's called the Pike Pinot or Sykes Minot Treaty. Sykes Minot. Sykes is S Y K E S. Pinot is P I N O T. The Sykes Pinot Treaty. And so all the land is divided up, and Great Britain gets to be the caretakers of Israel. That becomes very significant for this reason. Look down the page at verse 42. Verse 42 says, And he shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. The land of Egypt, remember I told you, Britain will invade Egypt, and Egypt will become a part of Britain. Britain is the king of the north. Now we have to change our concepts of what north and south meant and means in the scriptures, because it's not going to mean always what we think it means. When it says the uppermost north, when we talk in Ezekiel, we may not be talking about Russia. Now, according to the story, 1882 to 1965, Britain controlled all of this area. Britain controls it all. In fact, it remained a part of them all the way through this, this period of time, all the way through 1956. Do you remember what happened in 1956-57? A man named Abdul Nasser decided he was going to invade Israel so that the Palestinians, no, he didn't do it for the Palestinians. He did it for himself. He convinced Transjordan and he convinced Syria to join him. So those three nations invaded Israel. And that's when we had the Egypt, the Egyptian debacle. Because you see, intelligence had already told Israel that the invasion was about to happen. So what did Israel do? They put their planes in the air and they bombed every Egyptian plane on the ground. So they never got off the ground. So the war was canceled, technically. But there was still a war. Now, as we go through this, then we have to understand Britain is the king of the north. So look at verse 43. But he shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver. Oh, gold and silver. I want to tell you a fascinating story from a fellow that I talked to today. He works in dentistry. He 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 creates teeth is what he does. He's actually actually very very busy at this point in time in his in the year because everybody wants their teeth taken care of before Christmas so that they can smile better when it comes time for picture taking time. But as we were going through it, he began to talk to me about refinement. At what temperature can gold be refined? At what temperature can gold be refined? And he said, you know, I have to do this myself. So that's how I under I came to this understanding or came conclusion. He says, I had to go through the process. And he says, one of the things that I had to do when I was going through this process was I had to, oops, that was me dropping something. One of the things I had to go through and making this process was to make sure I had exactly the right temperature. And then he began to tell me there were two temperatures that he could watch. One was Celsius and one was Fahrenheit. So he gave me the two temperatures at which this whole thing comes about. And I found it fascinating. One temperature is 1064. 1064. That's Celsius. 
And one temperature is 1948. 1948. Did anything happen in 1948? That was when Israel became independent. 1948. Well, that was interesting, but that wasn't enough. He had to make it worse because he had to tell me what 1064 Celsius was about. 1064 was another period of time. Uh, I lost it in my notes. Forgive me. I will give it to you in a couple of minutes. But anyway, I got to keep my brain going. So let's continue. 1064 is actually the Celsius, and it's the starting time of a period. And so I've got to find it. But one of the things that's over 1064 and over 1948, that whole period, when he's working with gold and he's attempting to refine it, you have to look over the pot that you're working in. And you'll know that it is pure gold. The dross has already come off when you can see your reflection in the gold. God was refining Israel and he never, never took his eyes off of the nation as he's refining it. Never. You know, Israel doesn't think God is watching. God has never quit watching. In 1948, he made sure everything came together or began to come together for them. So things began to change completely at that point in time. Now, that takes us up through a period of time. And now we got to take a, a jump in time. Because chapter 11 covers such a wide span that there are periods in time where he just simply skips and goes to the next. So Daniel is listening to Gabriel, and Gabriel is now telling him, but tidings out of the east and out of the north shall affright him. Now, remember, he's in the beauteous land. He's in Israel. So he hears about something happening in the north and something happening in the east. In the north, it was Germany. And in the east, it was Japan. We are now ready to go into World War II. Remember, the Japanese began by taking colonies along the coast of China. Then they began to take other places, Indonesia and all of the rest, looking for oil, looking for precious materials. Germany, on the other hand, was trying to get out of debt. Adolf Hitler promised them a new world. He said the thing we're going to have to get rid of are the Jews, but that's no big deal. And we'll have to reclaim all of our land, to which they began going from Austria, Hungary, and all the way through collecting all of the land that they believed belonged to them. So the tidings were coming. Now, Britain, by this time, had really lost a lot of its luster. Certainly, they had ships all over the world that they could count on. But Britain itself was really quite weak. If it wasn't for the United States, we know World War II would have turned out entirely different than what it did. Now, it says in verse number 45, And he shall plant the tents of his palace between the seas and the beauteous holy mountain, and he shall come to his end there, and none shall help him. He shall come to his end there. What could have brought him to his end at that point in time? What could have brought him to his end? Bankruptcy. England was bankrupt after World War II. No money. All the money that they had had been invested in ships, had been invested in everything else. But their kingdom was falling apart because, you see, everybody was becoming independent. And so they didn't have a tax base that they could depend on. 
And so Britain, as a major player on the stage, as a king of the north, was no longer king. Things had changed. But who is the king of the south? Well, the king of the south happened to be the Sauds. Because you see the Saud family, they ended up with the nation of Saudi Arabia. And what was going on between the First World War and the Second World War? Oil. Oil. The Sauds were becoming wealthier and wealthier as time went on. In fact, their wealth continues. In fact, the United States is trying to help them become even wealthier because we keep wanting to buy their oil. Things are beginning to change. Not really. But the Saudis are giving are becoming more and more. Now remember, and this is notes that's not in notes. I've mentioned this before earlier when we were talking about Daniel chapter 7. I talked about the fact that the Midrashic writings say that the Saudis will go to war, not with Israel, but with Persia. And Persia will call on their best friends to help them. And who are their best friends? North Korea. Because you see, North Korea helped establish their atomic plants. So our last few verses are going to be dealing with, with those kinds of things. There was a lot of tension all the way along during this whole period of time from the beginning of the 19th century or the 20th century. Israel was already trying to move back into their own land. Now, in attempting to move back into their own land, they found themselves having a lot of problems because, you see, what was going on was the fact that Britain didn't want to give up what was going on. In fact, they would not even let the Jewish people come home who knew they were in trouble in Europe. They locked their borders so that the Jews couldn't get home. But thanks to going to the United States, well, wait a second, the United States wasn't helping them either. The United States was locking them out. If it wasn't for a president a president I don't like, who had built a monument here in Houston, Texas for the Jewish people, Lyndon Baines Johnson, secretly moved ships full of Jews from Europe to the United States to Houston, where they have a very large Jewish community thanks to Lyndon Baines Johnson. Thanks to Lyndon Baines. Now, he did a lot of other things, but that was the one thing that he did well. And he did it while he was a senator, undercover. But that was what was going on at that particular point in time. I can give you a whole lot more statistics and a whole lot more history, but I hope I gave you enough understanding that you can understand that the book of Daniel, and especially this 11th chapter, deals with time going from the Persian Greek empires all the way to 1948. Now, 1948, actually, 1946 was the end of the 45, 46 was the end of the war. 48 was when the nation was created. 1950, the right of return was passed by the Israeli Knesset. The right of return allowed Jews who could show their status were welcome to come home. No questions asked. We'll even help pay for your freight to get you here. All of that was going on at this very point in time. But you see, that still wasn't the end of this 69th week. 1967, a war, but that wasn't the end of it either. But it was on the 
sixth week of the seven-week period, 1973, Yom Kippur. On Yom Kippur, which was on October 6, 1973, the trumpet blew, and that final week began and ended on October 6, 2023. Now, I'm hoping to make for you a map, but as you can see, the map will be quite complicated. It will be something that's going to take a while, and once I make it, or Rod makes it, or Ross makes it, or somebody makes it, not that I'm putting them on spot, but it will take some explanation. And I will give you dates and times that fits the calendar. So you will have no questions as to what's going on or how it, how it works. I am so convinced that Daniel's 70 weeks actually are 7 times 7 times 49. Longer period of time. Longer period of time. 45 minutes is as long as most of you can endure, and, there's, and the seat of knowledge eventually wears out. So I wanted to stop and ask, anybody have a thought to add 